Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. It is uh, the middle of the summer now. We're in the dog days of August, so-called because Sirius, the dog star, rises with the sun. I want to take a couple of minutes from our usual routine to make a an announcement uh, starting on Monday, we are going to begin a uh, internet radio program called The uh, American System. The American System Network will be the uh, location. The American System. So what this means is that the briefing that many people have been getting uh, sent directly or finding it on tarpley.net or finding it on the Tax Wall Street Party U.S. Uh, website. That is going to transform itself now into an audio program of about one hour. So we think that this is a, uh, a timely action, that it uh, fills a void of reasoned commentary, anti-fascist commentary, certainly, and uh, that's going to be going uh, starting on Monday. We will have to uh, – well, you'll have to subscribe, and, and the exact conditions of that will be, uh, will be posted. So what I'd like everyone to do is certainly go to tarpley.net and uh, look for some notices that we'll have up there. But it looks like uh, this coming Monday, August 15th, is the day. How interesting. Fedagosto the holiday instituted by the Emperor Augustus. And, of course, everybody knows now, if you've been listening for some years, that uh, on Monday, Portugal, Spain, Italy, France, and southern Germany, like Bavaria, they will be on vacation. Right? The dog can uh, go to sleep in the middle of the busiest intersection of Milan and probably sleep there all day and not be disturbed. So plenty of time for you people over there to subscribe to The American System with the participation of yours truly. So please look into that. Please stay tuned to Tarpley.net, which I know you always do. You certainly always should. Now, we have come to an unprecedented uh, situation. We have just had a not even a death threat, but an incitement to assassination issued by the psychotic fascist Donald Trump. This is a call for terrorism. It's an open call for terrorism, the use of violence in an American political campaign, and not just any campaign, not for the dog catcher in Podunk Center, but for the president of the United States. Uh, it's, it's more than an assassination threat. Uh, assassination threat is somehow uncertain what's going to happen. This is an incitement. And there are quite a few psychotic individuals who will take that at face value. They will believe that. They will say, my master Trump wants me to go out and kill. And they will act on that. So all barriers are now gone in denouncing Trump for what he is. He's a candidate who depends on terrorism. Without terrorism, he has no hope. He wouldn't get any attention if he weren't making these threats. So this is, of course, a tremendous scandal. Uh, the Secret Service by rounded him up. They should have dragged him in for questioning. And indeed, the great populist, the great tribune of the people, he's getting kid glove treatment. He's getting sweetheart treatment because they haven't hauled him in and interrogated him. Anybody else, any normal person, you make a crack like that when you go through the uh, security line at an airport, you know what happens. Uh, if, uh, as, uh, as the former head of the CIA and NSA and a four-star general, right, a sinister figure to be sure, but nevertheless important because he's fighting Trump, he gains a certain moral standing just by virtue of fighting Trump, because everything else is prologue. What you're doing today 
is going to be, I think, in many ways, the most critical decision of them all. So Michael Hayden, not my friend, it's evil fighting evil. I've told you about this before. The only way good has survived is because evil does fight evil. They don't agree on what kind of evil to pursue. General Michael Hayden says if, if uh, somebody had made that crack at the entrance to uh, a Trump event or a Hillary event, they would find themselves in the back of a police wagon being interrogated by the Secret Service. Now, uh, the Secret Service, of course, a corrupt organization. Think of all those people who got to run across the White House lawn, all those nutcases that were allowed to cavort. Many of them, as I've reported over the, <coughs> over the weeks and months, Many of those White House runners are, of course, the bearers of threats and possible violence against Obama, his family, other government officials, right? And you kept, it's the only way you can look at it. And the fact that we had that rash of events some time ago, right, including Obama getting in an elevator with somebody with a gun, absolute insanity. The Secret Service can't be trusted, right? The Kennedy assassination, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, Sarah Jane Moore, we know all this stuff. John Hinckley Jr., the, the Secret Service hasn't done well. They're not what they claim to be. So in this case, we had the exchange about whether Trump was going to be interrogated, and the answer to that seemed to be no. The Secret Service was very laconic. They say, we are aware of the comments made earlier this afternoon. What the hell does that mean? What kind of double talk is that? A death threat has been issued against a presidential candidate, and indeed an incitement to kill. It's like putting out a contract. That was Trump's contract on America to interrupt our election and our sacred constitutional rights with terrorism from this swine. Uh, so, no, <laughs> this is not acceptable. The uh, Secret Service needed to interrogate him and uh, ask him, by the way, last week you called in cyber strikes by foreign powers. It was essentially a, an appeal broadcast to the world that people should feel free to get in there in the U.S. election campaign, cause chaos and mix it up, because that's the atmosphere in which the psychotic fascist Trump thrives. So uh, we did hear then from sources, right? This is Jim Scuto or Shuto of CNN, who said he had an unimpeachable source telling him that there had been contacts between the Secret Service and the Trump campaign. What that content might be, have been, I don't know. Right? In, in a rational world, it would be tone it down, you SOB. But maybe not, right? Maybe it would be something else. Who knows? But uh, this is totally inadequate. So now the, uh, the head of the Secret Service, and this is the fairly new one, right, put in after the latest rash of bungling, ineptitude, failure, 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 that person, and we'll look them up, uh, is on the verge of needing to be fired or resign. I think we've actually crossed uh, that point. For sure, General Keith Alexander, the head of the National Security Agency and the U.S. Cyber Command, that guy needs to resign just based on this stuff with Assange, right? NSA Cyber Command, don't tell me you can't shut down the WikiLeaks server. That is a fairy tale. That's for idiots. So uh, there are further implications, with, which we will explore here in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Back to World Crisis Radio. And it's uh, August 12th, 2016, in the hot, hot afternoon uh, here in Washington, D.C., we are going through the appalling situation after the latest psychotic homicidal outburst of the, uh, the lunatic Donald J. Trump, who now thinks he's above the law because the Secret Service obviously didn't lay a glove on him. So we have this 
this uh, huge uh, problem. Now, uh, when Trump says the Second Amendment people, maybe they can do something, it's obviously a, a call to assassination, because if you simply do a textual analysis, the Chicago Tribune did it, others did it. He's talking about a future time, you know, <coughs> in formal terms, he's talking about a future time in which Hillary Clinton has already been arrested, uh, elected, <laughs> elected. Hillary has been elected, and uh, she's in the process of naming some new uh, Supreme Court justices who may be quite possibly don't go along with the absolute fetishism of Scalia on the question of the Second Amendment. In other words, rights uh, are rights, but rights can be regulated, right? There is no right to call fire in a crowded theater, as Oliver Wendell Holmes rightly concluded. You have free speech, but it must not be abused. It's not a license to go wild. Good thing to bear in mind these days. The Constitution is our guide, but it is not, repeat, not a suicide pact, as some people want us to conclude. And as Lincoln said, you're telling me that I uh, have to treat these copperheads with kid gloves. So you're proposing that the whole government go down just to maintain this one provision, right, that these characters apparently have some expansive rights, which was the claim. So uh, the, the, the location of Trump's remarks is in a future time. Hillary has been elected, and she has named or is naming Supreme Court justices. So notice, the Trump remarks are a call to assassinate both the future president, Hillary Clinton, and unnamed Supreme Court justices, one or more, and this is not specified, but they're in there too, because they're the antecedents in the previous uh, paragraph. So that is something very real. Now, even though when we, when we look at it from this point of view, to determine if a call, an incitement, an instigation to this kind of uh, assassination violence, when you're trying to find out if it's there, you have to sort of look at the, the sequence, because it's true if you're talking about before the election, well, then, of course, the Second Amendment people could come out and say, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to have a big turnout the vote operation. That's fine. But he's talking ex explicitly about a time after that. And I don't care how mentally impaired, how cognitively crippled this particular specimen is. He knew very well that he's talking about a time after the election is over, right? Nothing you can do about it, as he says, except maybe the Second Amendment uh, people. Um, this is incompatible with representative government, right? This, this kind of stuff raises a big issue of whether a democratic system of representative government with constitutional rules can survive. That's, that is what Trump is doing. He is threatening our country, the United States of America, with uh, a kind of subversion and destruction, which is really unprecedented. Now, um, the assassination threat and incitement. Now, once he says this, however, this has to be not uh, interpreted narrowly. In other words, this is not to say that the only thing you're concerned about is something happening in the future. No, 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 no. The effect of this in the minds of the deranged and duped and, uh, again, uh, mentally challenged followers of Trump, this uh, kind of mob that populates his campaign events, they're going to take that uh, as a call to immediate, immediate action, immediate. Uh, and, of course, we're not just talking about loners or people who can be made to look like loners, we're talking about all kinds of things. In other words, we've been talking here. We know this better than anybody. We've been talking about a strategy of tension. And we've said that includes domestic terrorism, international terrorism. It includes cyber attacks. It includes financial destabilizations. It includes 
Um, I would I would include things like uh, strange events that don't usually happen, like uh, Southwest Airlines and now Delta having their uh, old, admittedly old and decrepit computer system somehow uh, blown apart so that you know t thousands and thousands of people are uh, stranded around the world. So it's all of that. It's a call to governments. It's a call to non-state actors. It's a call to hackers. It's certainly a call to Julian Assange and his gang. So it is very sinister. This is not whistleblowing. This is not democracy. This is the destabilization of the United States using Trump as the leading edge. And in that sense, he is acting as an enemy agent. He's acting uh, as someone who's uh, obviously very much at home with what we would call high treason, right? Overt acts. That statement was an overt act. Calling in the cyber attacks, an overt act. The assassination incitement, an overt act. Um, that is uh, the situation with Trump. Now, of course, once that's been done, you can't go back to business as usual. And I'm amazed that these sleazy little nobodies, these gutter snipes that Trump puts up there as his talking heads and surrogates on cable television news. I am amazed that they are allowed to continue. Uh, you'd think that they would be ostracized, ejected, shunned, shamed, confronted. Uh, but in many cases, no. There's a certain increase in the, uh, what can we say, the, the, the willingness to sit through lies by somebody like Jeffrey Lord or that, that silly blonde woman. Uh, maybe that is a little bit less, but generally speaking, they're still persona grata, and they have to become persona non grata, person who has worn out their welcome, to put it mildly. This is important because the uh, the people who vote for Trump, of course, are relatively weak-minded, and even as Trump campaign literature shows us, right, Trump, the Trump campaign is aware that a lot of their people don't want to identify themselves because supporting Trump is such a, it's such a, a shame, it's, it's such a, a, you know, disqualifying thing. Many people hide it, so they've got to be driven back underground. Back in a minute. Back to the World Crisis Radio here on the afternoon of August 12th. 2016, looking at the Ferragosto, or in Bavaria, I guess it's called Maria Himmelfahrt, uh, the Ascension um, of the uh, the Virgin Mary. Uh, that's August 15th. Right? That's when Europe grinds to a halt, um, and that has that actually this year that has some poss possibly disturbing strategic implications. Right, Catholic Europe, Southern Europe, comes to a halt. So. Uh, we still have uh, Trump, and again, I'm amazed that they let these gutter snipes, right, these uh, sleazy, ignorant, lying goons come back on the air and simply ply their trade as if nothing has happened. Notice, Trump is indefensible. They all, they all acknowledge that, right? If you ask them about Trump, they'll say, yeah, but Hillary did it, or it's the Two quoque argument, right? T U Q U O Q U E. Two quoque means you do the same thing. And that's the only argument. Well, the Nazis at the Nuremberg trials uh, in 1945 tried the two quoque argument and it was, it was thrown out. Uh, I think clearly because those other people, you know, the people in the U.S., Henry Stimson, I would have put him on trial. But this was not the trial going on in in Nuremberg. So the two quoque argument does not uh, work. Now, uh, cyber hacking, for example, when you say, I want hackers to come in and provide uh, documents, I want them to hack into uh, some cash somewhere, what, in the State Department, in the FBI? I don't know. But I want to see Hillary Clinton's um, 30,000 emails, which she did not turn over to the uh, FBI. Um, those emails, well, anybody who can get to those emails can do more than that. And that's the problem with hacking. Once you start with hacking, it goes from get me those emails to things like, 
uh, the disruption of transportation systems, airlines, railroads, you name it, uh, the disruption of power systems, including nuclear power systems, um, all kinds of information systems. You can generate a needless panic in the uh, stock markets and similar things, right? You can, you, can, you can play hell. You can generate chaos. So isn't that funny? Little Jeb Bush was right. Look at that. He was prophetic that Trump is indeed the chaos candidate. He can only thrive in the midst of chaos. When will the American people completely see through this fraud, this bloody farce? Um, <laughs> the uh, Italian paper Corriere della Sera said this is being interpreted as a threat because it is an instigation to violence on the part of Trump. Good. Then we had um, other uh, press, I guess we, we should, uh, you know, Le Mans said this is maybe one, one provocation too many for Trump. Uh, Rolling Stone was good. They, they talked about assassination. The London Guardian talked about assassination threat. Um, let's also notice one interesting thing. The foreign, the foreign reaction, now up to now, foreign countries, with the unfortunate exception of Russia, have sort of stayed somewhat at a distance. Uh, but now, in the wake of this, uh, this last one, they've been coming out. So President Hollande of France, uh, not popular, but the president of France, says this kind of talk from Trump makes me want to vomit. Good, vomit. The uh, German foreign minister, Steinmeier, said Trump is a preacher of hate. And this is a very unusual event, and it, I think it's a very big deal. The German foreign ministry, das Außenministerium, uh, and the German government, right, the Bundesregierung, have formally warned in a general statement against a Trump presidency. The German government is now on record saying, we, we don't want a Trump presidency, and we think it will be uh, very, very negative. Uh, and we know, of course, in uh, Italy, the government of Prime Minister Matteo Renzi has um, been saying for, what, for months now, they want Hillary Clinton to win. They were actually the, uh, the first. Now, I know that those alternate right uh, cretins will say, well, what does that mean? After all, these are precisely the Eurogarchs and Eurocrats who sell everybody down the river and on and on. But still, uh, you're getting a very big international consensus that Trump is a threat to humanity. He's a threat to world civilization as we have uh, known it. And um, let me also point out, right, you, you get to know some of these things by doing um, radio interviews. I've, I've been telling you now that uh, the government of Belarus, right, President Lukashenko or Lukashenka of Belarus is a survivor. He is a tough cookie. He is uh, someone who intends to be around long after this uh, election and the correspondent of the Belarus television told me their government is strictly neutral. If you watch that recent interview with President Assad of Syria, you will see that uh, Assad says, we don't take sides. We hardly listen to what they say. They only lie anyway. We wait until they take office, and then we judge them by their actions. Very wise, very smart. You can see why Assad is a survivor. And, of course, we hope that he'll survive for a good long time. Same goes for Lukashenko. We need such uh, voices. And the, uh, the correspondent, I guess it was a CNN correspondent, tried very, very hard to get Assad to commit to one side or the other, pro-Trump or anti-Trump. The other one I can tell you is that Iran, uh, 
the government, mm, I'm not sure, but in terms of uh, press TV, right, their media, they are very critical of uh, Trump, uh, but obviously not not to the degree of sort of, uh, you know, of, of endorsing anybody. This they're not going to do. And they're smart. They shouldn't do that. So now, we've also had, um, well, the background, right? I just want to mention a couple of things more. The question of Second Amendment remedies in this world of, uh, of, of lunatics, right? Madmen and madwomen. Um, the Second Amendment remedy started with Sharon Angle in October, I guess, of 2010, the great Tea Party election, when Sharon Angle, in other words, a sleazy, gutter snipe, ignorant woman, said, uh, you know, I, Harry Reid has been doing a really bad job. I hope we don't have to resort to Second Amendment uh, remedies. And she said that at least twice. It was a feature of her campaign. What the hell is that supposed to mean except the assassination of Harry Reid? That's what she was talking about, right? She said, we're close to it. I don't know if it's going to be, be necessary. Well, uh, Congressman uh, Clyburn, I think it was, pointed out that those remarks by Sharon Angle, as a, and she was a kind of a flagship for the entire Tea Party ship of fools, right, including uh, the woman in Delaware who thought she was a witch <laughs> and so forth, um, created the atmosphere for Jared Lee Lochner to go and uh, almost assassinate Gabby Giffords, but then in the course of this killed a half a dozen other people, including the top United States federal judge in uh, that state, okay? There's very serious stuff. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Then stay tuned to toply.net. You'll get more about the um, daily briefing going audio this coming uh, Monday, August 15th. All right, the daily briefing uh, that I, I've been helping to write for about a year and a half uh, is going to go on uh, on the internet as a uh, an audio uh, program, which I urge people to uh, to look at. We don't we won't go into the details now, because partly because we don't have them, but um, that's the idea. Stay close, stay tuned to tarpley.net, and by the time it gets to be Monday, please uh, please join us, right? and and uh, we'll be very grateful. So now um, here's the other thing, Obama is the founder of ISIS? Yeah. Nice try, sleazy Don, but I'm afraid not. Uh, ISIS was founded under a Republican administration. It was the Bush-Cheney administration. And the way that uh, ISIS came into the world initially was uh, as al-Qaeda in Iraq under the control of Zarqawi. Now, that Al-Qaeda in Iraq has gone through numerous name changes, according to one site, at least seven name changes, right? But that doesn't mean anything, right? Nusra is Al-Qaeda one day, and then Nusra is not Al-Qaeda the next day. You get the idea. But ISIS is the takfiri organization of Sunni Muslims uh, who hate the West, but they hate the Shiite power, Iran in particular, uh, even more. Now, the way in which this was founded, just to re refresh everybody's memory, was that in 2004, the U.S. was stunned, right? The neocons were stunned by the fact that the uh, U.S. invasion force was faring rather poorly against a united front of the entire Iraqi people for national independence, dignity, and kick the foreigners out. Always a very effective uh, program. If foreigners come and try to break down your door and, and rough up your wife and, and so forth. So the idea was, and I remember watching this at the time, the, the Bush-Cheney administration had a tremendous need to have something that said al-Qaeda 
in Iraq, right? They needed that because there, there had been no weapons of mass destruction, not even a can of raid, as Lionel said at the time. So there were no weapons of mass destruction, so they needed something that said al-Qaeda. And along comes Zarqawi, and he says, I pledge allegiance to um, this um, um, al-Qaeda organization, said Zarqawi, the madman. So that was what they needed. And with that, they then proceeded to the U.S. and the invaders. Try, they attempted to split and did split the united front of the Iraqi people against invasion. They split that and made that into a civil war between Sunnis and Shiites. Right? Um, the people who did this uh, originally, Bush administration, later on in 2007, still under the Bush administration, after the Republicans had lost Congress, you remember the, the monomania, right? The, uh, the complete contempt for the voters, which uh, Mad Dog Bush Jr. showed, right? George W. Bush. Uh, he said, I'm going to have a surge, and I'm going to have General David Petraeus be the general in charge of the surge. By the way, 2004, that was largely Petraeus. But by 2007, it was totally Petraeus <coughs> with just some help from his State Department sidekick, Ryan Crocker. All right? That's the other guy that was involved. And they... Uh, took this Takfiri organization, ISIS, uh, further, and they, uh, they expanded on the, on the civil war. And part of this was called the Anbar Awakening, right? Anbar province, precisely the heartland of uh, ISIS or part of the heartland of ISIS now. Or it could have been called the Sunni Awakening, right? Now, the Awakening, of course, was bribery. It was that these tribal elders and so forth were bribed. Uh, but that's where it comes from. That's the origin of ISIS. The idea that this started under Obama is absolutely uh, insane. And the, the hypocrisy of Trump is obviously astounding, breathtaking, unless you've got some experience, which by now we do. That is that uh, tr Trump pretends to be all riled up that Obama is the founder of ISIS. Well, Obama is not the founder of ISIS, but the guy who really is the founder of ISIS, General David Petraeus, is somebody that Trump would be ravished to have in his cabinet. We thought he would be considered for the vice presidency. Maybe not. But uh, there's a job waiting for David Petraeus. And if he can't pass through the Senate, can't get confirmed, they'll give him something in the White House, right? Because Trump has praised him on any number of occasions, and he said, oh, what he did was not as bad as Hillary, and look at him. He got a conviction out of it and other penalties, whereas Hillary's walking away. Sorry. Petraeus knowingly gave a book full of top-secret, cosmic, code-word information to his paramour, Paula Broadwell, who who, God knows, might have been a Matahari operative sent in by some people who wanted to shut down uh, Petraeus. And under normal circumstances, Petraeus would be shut down now. He'd be just rolling in dough on Wall Street, coming from his friend Henry Kravis of Kohlberg Kravis Roberts, and attending the, uh, the Bilderberger group, of course, with, uh, in the entourage. Petraeus would be in the entourage of Henry Kravis, that great uh, military and strategic thinker, but uh, there it is. Uh, Trump would uh, would would take take Trump, uh, Petraeus into his cabinet rather quickly. So, what it all comes down to, we've been talking about the strategy of tension. It's an old NATO concept, goes back to Italy in the late '60s. It has never been abandoned. It's being applied right now to the United States. And the reason why this is possible is because you have Trump. Trump is a factor of tremendous national weakness. He's an invitation to foreign powers to test the United States. In other words, it makes war by miscalculation infinitely more likely. I say to the American people, get this clown 
this bloody clown off the stage, right? That was one of the, uh, the comments from Congressman Scarborough of the Morning Joe program, right, and his uh, sidekick there, Mika Brzezinski. Scarborough and Brzezinski built up Trump, and then when he became powerful enough so he didn't need them, they then began to attack him. Right now, Scarborough, he may be like Dr. Frankenstein, right, genuinely frightened of the creature he has inflicted on the world. Scarborough says the Republican Party should get him out of there. They should fire him as the candidate, replace him before this bloody train wreck goes any further and generates something really horrendous. Take a look. It's all in the uh, the morning uh, briefing. Now, fortunately, there are some people who are listening to all this. The, the polls generally now say that about two-thirds of American voters, registered, I think, at this point, uh, don't want Trump to get control of the nuclear launch codes. Well, that, that's, that ought to be a voting issue, right? If you have your own life, the life of someone close to you, a family, children, grandchildren, anything like this, if there's any human being that you care for on Earth, or even other things, You've got to stop Trump, defeat Trump, politically, of course. Put him down, otherwise you make him uh, more powerful. So stop Trump, defeat Trump in the election. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. Once again, we invite you to stay in close touch with uh, tarpley.net, tarpley.net, and for that matter, Webster G. Tarpley Twitter. Uh, which then goes on Facebook, so you can find it there too. And that will be the written daily briefing is now going to go audio starting on Monday. So please check in and see how you can be a part of this uh, new dimension, right? trying to uh, rise to the challenge of the Trump fascist threat and the, the elections, uh, obviously, in general. So we've gone through uh, a lot of our strategic overview. Just Let's just remember, we can have an August surprise, we can have a September surprise, or we can have the traditional October surprise. Everybody is talking about, well, many, many commentators, the well-informed ones, are talking about Possible October surprise, I think they're reading it too narrowly. The philosophy of Aristotle is uh, unfortunately still with us. People believe in linear, literal things. <laughs> Don't think that way. Trump's call this past week, the Second Amendment people, that is a call to azimut in all directions to all players, state, non-state, doesn't matter who, to please visit chaos and destruction on the United States in the service in the service of Trump's loathsome dictatorship. And you really ought to think about that. The rule of law, you can see with, with Trump, there's no rule of law. The Secret Service is not giving us the rule of law. Any normal person would have been interrogated and most likely jailed and kept for questioning. And they can do that, right, because you've done an overt act. So... Uh, you have to think, if Trump got in, wouldn't you feel that chill if you tried to say, well, I think the Trump administration is wrong on, who knows what, education policy? Then you'd realize that you would be uh, highly vulnerable if a gang of Trump fascist thugs decided to visit your house or your business, talk to your boss. Uh, that's the world we're headed for, dear friends, unless people get mobilized. And I'm sorry if you're a worker and you're voting for Trump, even a petty bourgeois voting for Trump, but a worker, nobody has the right to be that stupid. And anybody who is that stupid, I fear, will not long survive, right? Simply the, the forces of the universe, right? Nemesis takes over, and that kind of stupidity is 
well, it's it's dealt with very seriously by the fates. So, um, and that's unfortunate. So look, um, August surprise, September surprise, October surprise. The idea is a, uh, a, a an event, a, a shocking, large scale, sh- big event, outside event, most likely, that would then stampede people into Trump's uh, corner. But nothing, but nothing can be ruled out. In other words, <laughs> the call which Trump issued is to essentially everybody in the world to let fly with whatever they've got. Uh, It's a sad day, but there it is. So right now, time to fight, not lament here. Bill Maher (laughs) done some interesting things in in recent past. He now says, look here, forget about what you really want, right? He's talking, he's talking obviously to an audience of stoners. He says that he's, he's going to give up his personal campaign for universal marijuana availability and he urges others to do the same, right? That that just about wipes out the Green Party completely, right? Their stoner base, uh, and the libertarians are not going to do too well there either. But Ma says no boutique issues in an Armageddon election. It's actually Armageddon, but we'll leave that aside. I want you to understand what I say. No boutique issues are tolerable in an Armageddon election. Too bad for the Green Party. Too bad, Jill. Too bad, Chris. We're going to get to you in a minute. Uh, Now, look, I also want you to know, suppose you are in the Green Party and you say, hey, I want structural reform. I know I fought with Bernie and these institutions are here. The perspective that Jill Stein offers you is the labor of Sisyphus. You roll the boulder up the hill and then it rolls back down, crushing you most likely, and then again and again and again through all eternity. A bad infinity of mechanical repetition. Now, the true infinity is this, a strategy. The true infinity is the breakup of the Republican Party. This is the indispensable precondition. The Republican Party must be destroyed, broken up, and you know the drill. A party for racists, bigots, reactionaries, warmongers in the southern states, Dixiecrats, but also rural America and the Intermountain West. That's the breakup of the Republican Party. There will still be Republicans, but they won't be able to sabotage the progress of the United States. Oh, one interesting thing happened this morning, right? During this Diane Rehm show, uh, the domestic hour from 10 to 11 here on WAMU and National Public Radio in general, Uh, Old Susan Page of uh, USA Today, uh, they were going through their their topic. So I sent in a Twitter, you can see it, saying, you've got to get the Congress back to Washington to vote the money for Zika, or those Republicans are going to be exposed as people playing dirty politics with the with with human lives. And she actually read it on the air. She says, we have a Twitter from Webster. Yeah, great. Webster that uh, that they have to be brought back. And the answer from one of these commentators was that, as far as he could see, the Obama White House had given up on forcing the Republicans to do this. Well, Obama, you have a constitutional power as president to force the Congress to come back and go into session. You can do that. You must do that. So um, what that, by the way, what that shows is if we had 50 or 500 people sending in Twitters to the Diane Rehm show, imagine the effect, right? This was just little me and I got through, right? I've I've done it before, obviously, and I haven't gotten through. But, uh, you know, in the middle of the summer, this is a good time to try it, right? Because the usual stuff is uh, is is less, uh, you know, there's less normal news. It's a, it's a good time to, uh, you know, to, to make some kind of an attempt, right? In other words, if you're going to invest some time, you know, get yourself on a nice hammock or chaise long, and, um, you know, while you're sipping your mint julep, you can send in uh, a whole bunch of stuff or just sit there with a phone and try to get on Limbaugh or, 
Levin or some of these other people. You got to con the uh, the call screeners and and, and so forth. Okay, now. <coughs> What are the signs of hope? I tell you, this entire thing is going exactly the way I told you it would. The breakup of the Republican Party, and just a second, we'll get to the uh, situation with the uh, with the Democrats. First of all, we have the 50, 50, count them, 50 national security and foreign policy experts of the Republican Party saying that Trump is dangerous. He is a threat to the United States. Yes, it's true. You're right. Well said. Now, of course, a lot of these people are odious. Um, a lot of them apparently are the personal entourage of Condoleezza Rice. So that's not very good at all, is it? Now, here's the idea. Let's be realistic, right? It's a fallen world. What's better, somebody who's, who got you a conventional war in the Middle East or somebody who is gunning to get you an all-out thermonuclear exchange that comes down on your empty head. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Back to World Crisis Radio, Webster Talk Leader in Washington, D.C. Inviting you, of course, to stay close to Tarpley.net this weekend and into Monday. Get the details on our new daily audio briefing, The American System, Alexander Hamilton, Henry Clay, and all the competent Amer uh, economists in the United States in the 19th and into the 20th centuries were the American system, not the Austrian school, not the Chicago school, not the British classical or uh, any of these others, but the American system. So. The 50, uh, including Hayden, say that Trump is a threat. He's a menace. He's dangerous. Good. Then we have 70 operatives, right? These are bigwigs, but they're, uh, you know, people in the congressional staffs. This is the sort of the, the, the apparatus, right? The apparatchiki, the nuts and bolts people in the Republican Party. And their call is to Reince Priebus. Uh, the head of the, re of the party, right, the party secretary, the head of the Republican National Committee, they ask Pribus, dump Trump. In other words, stop giving money to Trump. Focus the money on the saving of Congress, the House <coughs> and the Senate. So, um, so good. That's what they should do. Um, obviously, this is the Koch strategy. Now, you know, obviously, if you try to do this, it's not, not going to work very well, but they should try because, uh, you know, you have to save yourself from Trump or really more in a moral or, or historical way, but also uh, practically. However, uh, the Koch brothers have been, have been preaching this. Now, Trump's response to this is the usual uh, infantile boasting, posturing, and braggadocio where he says, oh, uh, I'm the one with the money. You need me. I don't need you. You need me more than I need you. <laughs> You're getting all the money from me because I'm Donald Trump. I think that's a lot of baloney. And I'm getting – here, let me see if I can find this. I'm getting emails from Trump. Here, here are his qualifications for the presidency. Huh? This, this is an email called Totally Dishonest Liberal Media – sent out by Trump. Dear friends, you've seen it. The liberal media can't stop telling outrageous lies about me. Wah, wah. Again, the most pathetic fascist is a, is a fascist who whines and complains. They are really a disgrace to journalism, and they are so desperate to mislead the American people about our campaign. Yet at every stage, we continue to prove them wrong, including smashing the Republican primary vote record by 1.4 million votes. Yeah, you are still a minority, and more people voted against you. They came, some came out to vote for you, but even more came out to vote against you, pulling off an incredible Republican national convention with much higher viewership than the Democrats' uh, disastrous convention. Yeah, this was shock theater, right? This was the vampire hour. These were the ghouls and zombies on parade. Uh, incredible, yeah, incredible. Uh, an all-time low 
the only one that uh, ter- reduced the proclivity of uh, the audience to vote for this uh, lunatic. Packing stadiums wherever we go. Yeah, this proves nothing because the people who come to the stadiums are precisely the losers who are not typical of the electorate. A lot of these are in the daytime. Those guys are unemployed. Raising $82 million in July alone from hundreds of thousands of grassroots supporters, we must continue our great momentum. Hey, Trump, you're a billionaire. You need my wretched pittance for your rotten campaign, which you are mismanaging. How much are you pay in Manafort? And where's your tax return? And where are your mental health records, Don? He wants to power the Trump train with your money. Well, no thanks. That'll be a cold day in August when anybody sends, uh, sends that stuff in. All right, now we have the revolt of the billionaires. This is the one that hits Trump hardest, as we know. Meg Whitman, billionaire. She, she's all out, going all out for, for Trump. She's going to fundraise. She's going to vote for Hillary. Bloomberg is against Trump and supporting Hillary. Warren Buffett. Totally anti-Trump. Mark Cuban, anti-Trump, and on and on and on. So the verdict of the billionaires is a rough one. Now, let's look at current and former members of Congress. Now, CNBC has a count, but I already found one that they don't have on their count. Here we go. Susan Collins, Republican U.S. Senator from Maine, will not support Trump. Uh, Kelly Ayat will vote for Trump, but not endorse him. So you tell me that. Get rid of Kelly Ayotte. She's, she's confused. She needs a long vacation, just like Trump. Richard Hanna, congressman, Republican from New York State. Ben Sass, U.S. Senator from Nebraska, no to Trump. Mark Kirk, U.S. Senator from Illinois, endangered, has said he's taking back his endorsement. Scott Rigel, or Rigel, U.S. Representative from Virginia, Republican, no to Trump. Here, another liberal Republican, Chris Shays, former congressman from Connecticut, no to Trump. Connie Morella, she was the congresswoman here in Montgomery County, Maryland. She's against Trump. Larry Pressler, former U.S. Senator and congressman from South Dakota. He had some, uh, uh, you know, some political uh, comeback attempts, but at least he's doing this. David Durenberger, former U.S. Senator from Minnesota, no to Trump. Joe Scarborough, again, trying to redeem himself, U.S. Congressman from Florida, Republican, uh, and then he helped Trump on his uh, uh, morally challenged uh, program, Morning Joe. Carlos Curbelo, U.S. Representative from Florida, no to Trump. Norm Coleman, not a nice guy, but Demo- uh, Republican former senator from Minnesota, no to Trump. Mel Martinez, former Republican senator from Florida, no to Trump. Bob Dold, Dold, U.S. representative from Illinois, no to Trump. J.C. Watts, I think he was the only black congressman they had for quite a while, got a lot of play. Uh, U.S. representative from Oklahoma comes from a civil rights family. No to Trump. Ileana ross Leitinen, one of the uh, uh, oligarchy, oligarchicos in the uh, Miami community, the Miami Cubans. Uh, no to Trump, former congresswoman. Justin Amash, former congressman from Michigan. No to Trump. We've got a couple of more names. We'll give them to you here. Uh, this is the CNBC list. So you have to You have to have this with you. We'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Please keep in touch with Tarpley.net to uh, follow our transition from a daily written briefing into an audio briefing. And that will start on the 15th of August, so Monday, Ferragosto, uh, 2016. So where were we? All those Republican president and former elected officials who are anti-Trump. Justin Amash, I think this is a libertarian, I think a Paul Tard, 
representative from Michigan, anti-Trump, no to Trump. Mark Sanford had some escapades, but hey, he's doing good. Congressman and former governor from South Carolina, no to Trump. Reed Ribble, U.S. representative from Wisconsin, no to Trump. Lindsey Graham, U.S. senator from South Carolina, no to Trump. Adam Kinsinger, current U.S. congressman from Illinois, no to Trump. Charlie Dent, U.S. representative from Pennsylvania, GOP. This is the ground zero, right? The Philadelphia collar counties and those uh, Republican women, uh, pro-choice, but, uh, you know, anti-Trump Republican women. So Charlie Dent says no to Trump. And the one they don't have is Gordon Humphrey of New Hampshire, former United States senator. And you remember at the convention... He said Trump was a uh, sick psychopath, a sick sociopath, I guess he said, a sick sociopath, and that the people throwing him out, who shouted down even a roll call vote, were brown shirts of the type who practice fascism. Good for you, Gordon uh, Humphrey, right? There's always hope for redemption, no matter what Chris Hedges says, by the way. Um here. Let's, we'll get back to the Democrats in just a minute. Let's look at the Green Party. I now had a chance to look at Chris Hedges' essay on the myth of human progress. So the misanthropic, uh, anti-human Chris Hedges says that human progress is a myth. Well, you're going to be in big trouble trying to explain how the population of the world is where it is right now and how uh, longevity, the average lifespan, has expanded the way it has. There are objective criteria, Chris, which are not subjective of the type that you like, but they're objective, and they, they establish that there is progress beyond, beyond, a, a, beyond question. Now, I do not argue that the progress is automatic or linear. It can be, there can be no progress. As a matter of fact, if Trump became president and started carrying out his fascist uh, desires and his psychotic urges, uh, it's quite likely that human progress as a whole could be stopped through the destruction of civilization, as old uh, Tony Schwartz has said and many others have said, and I guess I said it even first. Uh, what I was looking at, though, with Hedges is he, of course, is a Calvinist. He follows John Calvin of Geneva. What do Calvinists believe? Well, generally, the hallmark of Calvinism is, first of all, you believe in the absolute depravity of the human being. There is no saving grace. There is nothing, right? You are dirt. You're worse than dirt. I won't go through all the things that they've said. Absolute depravity. And therefore, your only hope is total, prede uh, t total predestination, prede predestining you to be in the category of grace. And how do you know who's who? Well, traditionally in Calvinism, it's been, if you have money, that's a sign of grace. So if, you're, if you've got a lot of money, then you're probably one of the elect, right? the elite going to uh, heaven. So he writes a whole bunch of stuff here about Herman Melville. We have to hear all about uh, Melville's uh, symbolism, uh, Hedges believes that to be white is to be a genocidalist. I seem to get that out of there. Uh, we, we, anyway, we, we come to rest here with, with Hedges in a blind alley. In other words, the, the condition of humanity is tragic, but any attempt to uh, improve above all the material situation of Humanity, right? In other words, the availability of water, housing, health care, education, jobs, production, proper nutrition, all of that. That's all out of the question because that violates the global warming taboo, right? Any effect, anything you're going to do that has any possible effect is going to run afoul of the carbon footprint. So you're caught in a blind alley. I've often called this a block universe, right? That's a block universe, because there's no way out. <laughs> if you just sit there, everything collapses. And if you try to do something, it'll collapse through the slightly different means of uh, 
global warming. I, as I said, I think Hedges gets a sadistic pleasure out of telling people that they are doomed and damned and so forth. But what he's essentially giving you is the anti-Renaissance and anti-American line of Calvin saying that humanity is depraved and how can there be any progress? I'd read you some of these quotes, but you get the idea. We'll do some, ne some more next week. I was actually wondering, you know, you look at the Trump convention with all that negativity, <laughs> is, you know, is, how, how, to what degree is Hedges actually supporting Trump? I don't know. Um, he also, he shows how little he knows, right? He's a pedant, of course. And he writes in this thing about, he writes about Herman Melville. But then he has the Ulysses canto of the uh, Dante's Inferno. And he gives you a, uh, a little quote from that. He says, this is what uh, Primo Levi thought about when he was in a fascist prison under Mussolini. Anyway, some of this stuff is just brought in as a parade of knowledge to make you feel little <laughs> and to feel really depraved. But don't do it. Don't let Hedges do that to you. Uh, what Hedges has to remember is the thing that is damning uh, Ulysses uh, and, and you can see this by the position in the Inferno where he is in the eighth circle is um, that he's a giver of bad counsel because he tells his people, he says, look, you people who have been through so much with me, we've got to go to the other side of the world and find what's there. Right. And you're told not to do that because that's where purgatory is thought to be located. So when they get close to purgatory, then a storm comes up and their ship is destroyed. So. Ulysses is imprisoned inside this flame, and it's through the 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 flame that that his words come out. But his crime, his sin, is to be a giver of bad counsel, and I would suggest that's what Hedges is. Hedges is a giver of bad counsel. And let me all, let me contrast this. Right, this is not necessary. Let's take somebody like Gnom Chomsky, for heaven's sake. You know, I hope, what I think of Gnome Chomsky, and it isn't pretty, but even Gnome Chomsky is now out saying that Trump is almost a death knell for the human species. That's a, a decent statement. Trump is almost a death knell for the human species. I take it he means because he's almost elected. He's not elected. If he were elected, he would be a death knell for the human species. Uh, Chomsky is also against the Brexit and therefore against, uh, against Trump. So there are people who are not so different from Hedges who somehow find their way to a much better um, result, right? a much better position on Trump. Uh, whereas Hedges and, of course, his uh, – the green, the environmentalist Passionaria, uh, Jill Stein, they have reached uh, an absolute low point. So back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Back to World Crisis Radio, our last segment here on uh, – recording here on August 12th in Washington, D.C., here in the uh, oppressive uh, heat – of the Washington summer. Um, look, concerning the Green Party, hey, the Green Party, meaning uh, Jill Stein and her uh, running mate, uh, Baraka, right? Ajamu Baraka, they're going to be on CNN this coming Wednesday, I'm pretty sure. Wednesday it is, the 17th of August. So Wednesday, August 17th uh, at uh, – let's see if they tell us when it is. Anyway, it's, it's in the evening uh, on CNN, right? Time changes according to the zone, so look it up. Um, as I told you before, right, if somebody can just get on to national public radio by sending one Twitter – I would ask you people out there, and you will, you will thank me for this, and if you don't do it, you will rue the day. Why don't we try to generate a Twitter storm that these people should, should drop out? They should go away. They should dry up and disappear. 
uh, as uh, as Bill Maher, that great sage, says, no boutique issues in an Armageddon election. That sounds like a refutation of the at least the main premises of the uh, of the Green Party. Of course, the Green Party has a lot of things they copied from us. Right? Tax Wall Street Party. They copied our stuff on student loans. Copied our stuff on. Wall Street sales tax to some degree anyway. But uh, Wednesday, August 17th, New York City, 9 p.m., sorry, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Wednesday, August 17th. Make a note of it. Um, check up on my uh, my Twitter. I'll be reminding you about it. Get on Twitter. Get on some social media and expose these people because if, if Stein – is able to shave off a few, a few percentage points. You're going to have Ralph Nader again. What did Ralph Nader mean? Uh, I doubt that, although Gore was very bad, I doubt that he would have been as uh, big a warmonger as Bush <coughs> turned out to be. So uh, you can, again, thank Ralph Nader for the Iraq war. Right? In, in some ways, you can also thank him for, for 9-11 and for the Afghan war, too. Uh, but the uh, average person can be best convinced, I guess, with the Iraq war. So thank you, Ralph Nader. And what are you going to be thanking Jill Stein for, right, for her silly, self-centered, uh, airhead campaign? Okay. Wednesday, August 17th, 9 p.m. Now, the Republican Party needs to collapse. Now, let's talk a little bit about the two, the two parties because we want to essentially extinguish one – and split the other. The Republican Party is an ideological party, right? They've always said, we're the movement conservatives. Well, what's the ideology of the movement? It is the William Buckley National Review kind of sanitized right-wing stuff. They don't want any Nazis in the front rank. They don't want any Ku Klux Klan hoods showing kinds of things like this, right? They don't want white supremacists being the candidates, but they're ideological. Now, the ideology is funded by people like Koch on domestic economics, right? Deregulation, union busting, all the rest of that. Tax cuts for the rich, obviously. Tax cuts for corporations, right? What, what Trump is doing, he's trying to get them on board. Uh, and at the same time, something like Sheldon Adelson, that we need to have more wars in the Middle East. Uh, there's also the Chamber of Commerce, right? They want various things. Now, the Republican Party needs foot soldiers. The foot soldiers are the evangelical fundamentalists, right? The Holy Rollers or Elmer Gantries. And they are showing that they do not believe in God. They have no use for Christ because you can't do that with Trump, right? Two divorces and now uh, this latest uh, stuff, right? Lying. How about pride? How about the seven deadly sins? Trump is, uh, is beating everybody on all of them, I would say. So uh, the evangelical Christians bring foot soldiers. The, uh, I think the Archie Bunkers, this is the, somehow the, the group that has gotten lost in the analysis – is the urban and suburban Archie Bunkers, especially in the Northeast, maybe some in, in California too, maybe in the urban Midwest, Archie Bunkers, right? These are just you know cynical people who are themselves bigots, warmongers. And Trump is really that. In other words, in terms of where he comes from and what he says, he's kind of the king of the Archie Bunkers. But notice, if you're gonna have an ideological party, you've got to have enemies. And you've got to have a, uh, an aggressive ideology of attacking those enemies. That's why the Republican Party is so xenophobic, right? They have to be hate mongers because they need that. And it, you have to c promote an atmosphere of extremism and irrationalism. Uh, obviously, because if anybody really thought a little bit about their own self-interest, they would have to say, why am I here? I'm voting for candidates who tell me they're anti-abortion and they don't like uh, the m moneyed elites or something, <laughs> Koch, uh, 
But they, they tell me they don't like the money at least. But I'm I'm voting to cut my own throat because I'm voting to cut my own Social Security, my own Medicare, my own Medicaid, my own food stamps, right? All of that ideology that this somehow violates the Austrian school or the or of the Chicago school and so forth. People are cutting their own throats. There is that book, uh, What's the Matter with Kansas, right? Why do people do this? And, of course, the answer is, if there is no real economic populism to be seen of the type that we, I, represent, right, Tax Wall Street Party and yours truly, then people will gravitate to cultural populism. What is cultural populism? Candidates who get out there and say, I represent Kansas values or Indiana values or whatever kind of values you want. What does that mean? Well, it means that I'm not a city slicker and an urban elitist and all that stuff. Of course, that's exactly what you are. So this is gullible people who are easily duped uh, getting taken in by this kind of horrible uh, machine. But so remember, the Republicans are crazy. The Republican Party is a madhouse and has been for decades. You could listen to their presidential debates over a period of four or five six cycles, and you get the idea. These people can't get along without starting World War III because they're so bellicose, and they're trying to overinterpret every conceivable trifling incident, right? As, as Bismarck would have said, every time some stupid thing happens in the Balkans, I don't want to be dragged in to, uh, at that point, a world war. So uh, they need enemies, and they've got this ideology. Now, the way, of course, this is going to be smashed up is what's what's actually happening, that the Koch people and the Adelson people and many more of the big donors, all those billionaires that we, we were talking about before, they're turning against Trump. And if we get, you know, a few more weeks into the campaign and Trump's uh, numbers are continuing to decline, at that point, they will dump him. They will have no choice because the donors will force them uh, to dump them. Now, the Democratic Party is, of course, a confederation of interest groups. Some of them are interest groups. Some of them are identity politics groups. Some of them are both. Now, in the Democratic Party, the decisive group is, once again, Wall Street, uh, here we have environmental billionaires and uh, Soros above all, right? Make Soros the classic figure. Uh, you got lawyers, women, blacks, Latinos, Asians, environmentalists, LGBTQ, unions, hang on, the disabled, the teachers' unions, the anti-gun groups, the campaign finance groups, the petty broccoli government. And they're looking for benefits and confession. So that's why the, Repub the Democratic Party seems calmer. But uh, that will have to split apart with the Wall Street group against some of the other groups. And we'll be talking about that. See you next week on World Crisis Radio. And don't forget to tune in on Monday, August 15th.